and then some mistake. Because the church used to gather on Wednesday nights or sometime during the week to study the Word of God. A lot in small groups, they'd sit around, they'd study the Word of God, study it together, discuss it, go over it. And I think there's a temptation in a lot of uh, churches today that we just kind of skip, oh, that's boring. That's boring, or maybe everybody already knows that, and, and you can't assume anybody knows anything anymore today, man. To be honest, a lot of us as adults, we really don't know the word like we should. Because a lot of our pastors that say, well, that's boring, or everybody already knows that, and they just skip right over it, but actually we don't know it. And it's really not boring, amen? And don't be, you know, worry, uh, Sean or Amos get caught up, and, you know, you've got to have a... Especially in the prophetic, you've got to have something that's going to just shake everybody, just something everybody's going to go wow over. And you can't do that. You can't do There's a comment on Facebook by a very f uh, familiar uh, pastor, a uh, friend of mine, Daniel Brown. And Daniel Brown was teaching a uh, large group of uh, Bible college students in the homiletics class. And he told them that they didn't have to worry about being clever every time they got in front of their congregation. And I haven't, I, I, I haven't seen that many comments on Facebook in a long time. People were really impressed with that. A lot of pastors, a lot of Bible study teachers were very relieved at that. that wow, I don't have to. Paul said, it's not by convincing words. It's not by my vocabulary. It's not by anything that I'm going to say out of my own wisdom that's going to impress anybody. It's, it's you, Lord, and your word. And we have his word, don't we? The problem is we have his word, but we don't have his word. Amen? Sometimes we have his word, but we don't have his word. It's here, but it doesn't get down to the heart. Amen? I'm glad I didn't use any gel tonight or I would have gotten it all over my Bible. All right, Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Can I get somebody to read tonight? Anybody want to read? Matthew 4, verse 1. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, why don't you go, what uh, verse was that? Yeah, no, that's good right there. Uh, thank you. I lost you for a second there. No, I, there a couple of things in here I want to highlight before we move off of chapter 4, but it talks about here Jesus fasting for 40 days. We as a church just got off of the beginning of the year a 21-day uh, uh, fast. Along with many other churches, we did a fast for 21 days, and I think it's a good thing to fast every year. And do we, people ask, why do you fast at the beginning of the year? It's just good to, for the start of the, anything new. It's like if you're going to start a new job, a new ministry, a new adventure, it's good to pray, amen? Anytime you get ready to start a new meal, Marcus, it's always good to stop and give the Lord praise for that meal, amen? And, and here, uh, here Jesus is talking about a 40-day fast. A lot of people say, well, I don't know if, if fasting is mandatory. I don't know if... if uh, if fasting is absolutely necessary. Well, I don't know if it's mandated, or I don't know if you have to fast as a New Testament believer or not, but I believe that you should want to fast. There's another verse in the New Testament that says, when I, or when we pray and fast. Not if we pray and fast, it's when we pray and fast. And Jesus himself fasted for 40 days. That's a long fast, 40 days. Anybody ever fasted 40 days? Have you? Uh, what kind of a fast was it? Full fast, Full fast water only? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Do you drink any juice? Okay. Okay. She ate nothing. They ate nothing. They had they had uh, juice and they had broth, and they but they actually physically ate nothing for forty days. Pardon me. You do that every year. What what time of year? Whenever you feel called. Yeah, yeah. Amen, amen. Now, I've never fasted that far along. I fasted. Uh, well, it was 30 days as long as I've ever fasted. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't liquids only. I have fasted for uh, two weeks, liquids only. Uh, I fasted uh, four, uh, 10 days water, no, seven days water only. And that's the kind of fast this was. It was water only fast. But that's good. That's, that's great. It's a great discipline to fast. Especially for us Americans. Especially for us who like to go over to Golden Corral after church on Sunday. That's, why did I bring, that's the opposite of fasting. That's gorging yourself. That's, that's gluttony. That's gluttony. It's good to talk about fasting because we never talk about fasting. And when we talk about fasting, but we don't talk about the opposite of fasting, which I just kind of alluded to, which is uh, gorging yourself or gluttony. Or gluttony. Not a word you hear in church anywhere. Everybody's afraid to use that word. Pastors won't stand up in front of you and get in front of the TV and go uh, the internet and say, you know, uh, uh, to, to eat too much is a sin. Gluttony. Oh, it got really quiet here. Gluttony. And this was Jesus going on his 40-day fast. And it says, the tempter came to him. How, how or why is it that every time we really strive to get close to God... Let's say like Jesus here, he went, he, took a, he went on a fast. Let's say we go on a fast or we go on a sabbatical or we're going to read our word extra amount every day or, or we're going to give up something. A lot of people give up things for the Lent season and we're going to try to get closer to God. We're going to try to really enter into a new place with the Lord that we have ever been in before. You feel like you're really getting somewhere in Christ. You feel like you're really advancing. You feel like you're growing. Maybe it's your own personal walk. Maybe it's your own personal a sense of holiness, maybe you're getting closer, maybe through your time of reading, through your time of prayer, through the disciplines of fasting, disciplining the nature of ourselves within our bodies, and we feel closer to God, and as soon as you do that, it seems like the enemy comes along just like he did with Jesus. True? How come is that? That's my question tonight. No one knows, do they? Yes, sir. So, Sean says, is it adver he's their adversary. He does things to ad uh, ad ad adverse us or to uh, reverse anything new or any time we get close to the Lord, the adversary comes in. He tries, I uh, simply said, he tries to mess it up. He tries to get between God. And, but why did he do it here? Well, I think Sean answered that. He did it with Jesus like he does with us. Because we are getting closer to the Lord. It's paying off whatever we're doing, whatever discipline it is. If we're reading more, if we're praying more, if we're fasting, we are growing closer to God, and the devil doesn't like that. Amen. Why didn't he bother me before? Because you weren't doing nothing before. How come he's coming after me now? Because you're growing closer to God. The devil didn't care about you, didn't have any worries or cares about you at all when you weren't praying, when you weren't reading, when you weren't fasting, when you weren't really growing with the Lord. He knew he had you, the devil, right where he wanted you, didn't he? Now you start growing with the Lord, you start advancing, you start learning more, you start growing closer to him, and the devil's going to come, he's going to oppose that. He's your adversary. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Amen. Did you hear what she said there at the beginning? I, I liked it all, but especially the beginning. We become the adversary of the enemy. 
instead of being the enemy's friend. Yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I had a friend. So the pastor, he, he since passed away, but had nothing to do with his fasting habits. Uh, he, he pastored. He also uh, was a bivocational pastor. During the day, he laid bricks in the uh, hot uh, deserts of uh, California in the summertime. And he worked for the city, and they would build those, those uh, sound walls, you know, next to the freeways where the homes were, the really high brick He'd be up and down that ladder all day with three or four of these big old heavy bricks in his hand and uh, laying brick up in that wall, and he'd be fasting. He fasted 30 days one time doing that. It was just absolutely, absolutely amazing. But, but that point, before we go on, I want to highlight that again, that she said, we become the enemy's adversary. That's why he comes at us. That's why he comes at us. We're no longer compliant. We're no longer... Uh, you know, we're, we are no longer uh, simply on his side. We are no longer, uh, 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 when we're no threat to the enemy, he's going to back off. He's going to leave us alone. But when we come closer to God, he's going to be our adversary. He's going to come at us. That's good. I like that. Amen? All right, let's continue on. Uh, I wanted to highlight here again, it says, uh, oh, with Jesus here, verse 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes or proceedeth from the mouth of God. That's why I like the King James, when it proceedeth from the mouth of God. What did Jesus do? Well, the late great E.B. Hill, one of the greatest preachers that ever has lived in this world, he passed away about 10 years ago now. E.B. Hill has a great illustration of that. He says, E.B. Hill says, we should respond to the devil's attacks the same way Jesus did. And Evie Hill would pick up his Bible and he says, whenever the devil comes at you, he says, come back at him and hit him with the word. And he'd take his Bible and he act like he was smacking the devil. Amen? Hit the devil. with His point was to hit the devil back, to attack back with the word. And Jesus did it for us. Here he gave us the example. He says, it is written. He quoted the Bible back to the enemy. Whenever the enemy comes at you, quote the Bible back at him. My mother-in-law's got one of her favorite scriptures. She says, he who is in me is stronger than he who is in the world. Whenever she feels attacked, she quotes that scripture. Who does she quote that scripture to? Her adversary. The one who's attacking her. You've got to hit the devil back, hit him where it hurts, hit him where it counts, and hit him with the word of God. Amen? Do that. He's got no, he's got no response to that. He's got no response to that. And so many people have argued, debated over the years, why did Jesus? Jesus just quoted scripture as an example unto us. And it, it makes it very clear here at the end in just a few minutes. But Jesus, Jesus did what we need to do, hit him back with the word. Uh, but on, on every word, on every word that comes, if the believers today, if we had more of the word that resided within us, that was readily available for us to throw back at the adversary when we were under attack, a whole lot better off we would be. A whole lot better off we would be. If we knew the word again like we used to know the word, the church used to know the word, the church used to be able to, to throw back scriptures at the enemy. But now you've got to get on the phone or we go Google it on the internet, find out. And sometimes it's too late to Google it, amen? Sometimes you've got to just get back and listen.